try to hand it to you. Just tell me to be, tell me not to. All right, good morning. Welcome in. We're going to go ahead and get started uh, if we can. All right, my name is uh, Jason Hiles, Dean of GCU's College of Theology and Grand Canyon Theological Seminary. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. If you have not done it already, please uh, make sure you scan and register your attendance using that QR code behind me on the screen. Uh, this helps us to know who is here uh, all together. A uh, quick bit of housekeeping uh, before I forget it. If you, are, if you were hoping to sign in as you came in because one of your instructors offered uh, participation credit or something like that, you'll need to make sure when you go back into the lobby at intermission you find the correct sheet to sign in on. So if you signed, in, there are multiple instructors involved. So make sure you find yours uh, to sign in there uh, if you're uh, hoping to get credit or something along those lines. So um, today's event is a One Foundation speaker event. We're very pleased to offer these on occasion. This particular occasion, I'm very enthusiastic about our speaker. Today's topic uh, is transhumanism, brave new world or ancient heresy. I'm looking forward to hearing from a specially invited speaker uh, who we're going to invite up and introduce shortly. After the initial uh, presentation, we'll have a brief intermission. So during the intermission, if you'd be interested in submitting a question, something you'd like to hear us talk about, we will have a panel discussion with Q&A in the second portion of the program today. So uh, initially a presentation, brief intermission, and during the intermission, uh, I believe the baskets are near the back or perhaps a, right on the edge of the lobby. If you'd like to drop a question off, write it on an index card, drop it off there. We'll take a look at those when we get into the second part of what we're up to. Uh, for now, I'm going to offer a few uh, brief uh, introductory comments, sort of uh, talk a little bit uh, about the topic today and maybe uh, clear a little bit of groundwork. Uh, for those of you who have gone to one of the Valley Spring Training Games, anybody go to any of the spring training games? A couple of baseball fans, not a lot, or at least not awake yet. Uh, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're sort of a group that goes out that is ground uh, keeping, and so they're going to clear the field and clean things up and set the stage, and that's sort of where I am. I'm not one of the skilled players. This is not my area of expertise. The real uh, program begins when the speaker comes up, so I'm really looking forward personally to learning from him. I'm very much a novice in this area. Uh, so for now, I'll just sort of talk a little bit about what is this topic, what does this topic mean? Uh, first, you might just be asking something as simple as, what is transhumanism? Uh, anytime you use the uh, prefix trans in our culture, it raises questions. So I'll just say that uh, out of the gates, the prefix uh, is derived from a Latin term that signifies something like across, through, to the other side of, or beyond. When the prefix trans is attached to various root words, it alters their, their meaning. So common English words, words that you use probably every day or every week, involve things like translation. Uh, etymologically, that relates to meaning carried across languages. Translucent relates to light passage from one side of an object to another. Transportation, moving something beyond one point to another destination, transmutation, and so forth. And so these are uh, fairly common ways of using the prefix trans. In the case of transhumanism, the topic today, the prefix alters the noun human. Normally references a kind of progression from human beings in their natural statement, uh, state uh, through selective enhancements towards something beyond the base model, so to speak. Ideally, transhumanism relates to progress and enhancement so that the final state is preferable to the original state. So many of the possibilities or perhaps realities now that some of the technologies have advanced uh, relate to extended longevity, 
or long, longer life expectancy, increased well-being, uh, enhanced happiness and prosperity, and then in uh, addition to that, super intelligence uh, uh, and altering of the intellect. So transhumanism we might think of as a futuristic vision for what it uh, might be to be a human, which raises the question, what should a human be? What is a human? What should a human be? And what happens when we begin to enhance? Do we add to or subtract from the biblical vision for human flourishing? So some of the things that are going to be discussed today. Secondly, we might ask, why does transhumanism matter? I'll be brief here because I think you're going to hear uh, quite a bit about this from our speaker. But simply stated, transhumanism intersects with the concept of what it means to be human and is therefore of profound theological and ethical significance. From a Christian perspective, one may wonder what happens when those made in the image of God begin to alter themselves as if they have reached, by virtue of technology, something like uh, a godlike status? Are we in a good position to determine what is actually best for us, or uh, does transhumanism tempt us with a kind of forbidden fruit that will result more in curse than blessing? Uh, to be decided, to be discussed. All right, so what to expect this morning? I've already mentioned uh, that the speaker will come up in just a moment. Uh, before he does, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Daisy Savarirajan to come forward and uh, open us in prayer and also to introduce our speaker. Daisy, if you will. Thank you, Dr. Hiles, for setting the tone for today's event. So welcome, everyone. Good morning. Are you excited to be here? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, why don't we take a quick moment to put our hands together, close our eyes, bow in our heads, and look to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this beautiful day as we begin week 11. We are just so grateful for everything you have done for us and you have led us this far. You are such a wonderful God. You have provided for all our needs and you have watched over us and protected us from evil. For that we are extremely grateful. And now as we um, would like to um, spend some time listening to this very important topic that interfaces faith and science, I pray that Everyone over here will have open hearts and open minds, and I pray that they will be able to take something relevant that will be applicable to life in general and maybe um, even their prospective uh, professions. And I pray that you would bless the speaker, Mr. Dan Churchwell, and I pray for technology and every other issue. I pray that everything goes smoothly and we will be enlightened and uh, we will be able to um, see through the lens of the Bible what exactly um, you have for us and you want us to know and learn and be able to apply it to our lives. Watch over all of us, lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I have this unique privilege to introduce Mr. Dan Churchwell. By the way, he's not new to GCU. When he visited us last time, it was right at the cusp of COVID-19. And yeah, he came and then um, everything uh, went under lockdown. So Dan Churchwell serves as the Director of Programs and Education for the Acton Institute, where he manages external relationships with foundations, higher education institutions, businesses, and um, non-government organizations. He has taught and lectured widely on issues related to the intersection of philosophy, theology, and economics. His current research interests include media ecology, technological ethics, and the future of work. Prior to Acton, he spent 10 years teaching in higher ed in the Pacific Northwest, as well as working for multiple businesses, including a Fortune 100 company, and as a commercial real estate analyst in Southern California. So why don't we um, put our hands together and join me in welcoming Mr. Dan Church. Well, thank you, Daisy. Uh, thank you, Jason, and all the others that have helped put this event together. Such a delight to be on campus. Um, I flew East Coast, West Coast last night, so um, got in about 2 a.m. Uh, my time, and I wasn't expecting the monsoon. I don't know if any of you were up last night, but I got drenched just 100 feet walking from my car to the hotel. So thank you, Phoenix, for bringing in some, uh, some water to me. 
But uh, I, I do realize that some of you are disappointed, but congratulations on getting to the uh, sweet, or the uh, NCAA tournament. What a cool opportunity for uh, Go Lopes, right? And, uh, okay, Go Lopes. All right. Um, I probably shouldn't admit this, but I'm from the Pacific Northwest, and uh, I'm a Gonzaga fan, so I know. I know, sorry about that, but it, it's fun to see them go to the, uh, the Sweet 16 again for the ninth time. Uh, well, as Daisy mentioned, the last time I was here, I was speaking at a conference um, on faith and technology as well and science um, just a week before the, the world shut down. It seems like a hundred years ago. Um, but I, I speak and travel widely on behalf of the Acton Institute. The Acton Institute is a think tank um, where we promote a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. We've been around 33 years and uh, really have some great interactions with GCU. Many uh, faculty members have been to several of our conferences. We have a highly competitive emerging leaders program, internship program in the summer. Uh, it's paid. And, uh, and several, I think four or five students from GCU have come through that program over the past few years. So it's a delight to be back on campus. Um, but it, uh, I'm really wanting to get across a conceptual framework on technology and transhumanism. Transhumanism is a really fun topic to talk about, but if we delve immediately into that, we miss some contextual framing that I think is essential before we can get into the talk specifically on transhumanism. So I'm going to set some frameworks that we can then work off of. And I do love Q&A. And so I hope, I know some of you can be here for the first hour, but not here for the second part. But if you're able to stay for the Q&A, I love to have student interactions, student questions. We're gonna have a great panel. Some of your esteemed faculty will be on it with me. And so I won't be carrying all of that. We'll have some good conversation, but I'm looking forward. If you do have questions, please do write those down and get those to us in the intermission. All right, let's get to the meat of it. I want to acknowledge up front that this talk is both exploratory and interdisciplinary on purpose because a day doesn't go by without some new story or hot take on technology, whether from the technology will solve all of our problems camp or the robot overlords are at the gates. This is a very unique perspective, right? And it seems polarized. Uh, the technology conversation, no matter what discipline you're in or what your interests are, is unavoidable. In fact, David Nye, in his brilliant book, The American Technological Sublime, argues that technological progress is actually America's true civil religion. Technological progress is actually America's true civil religion. In fact, in 1930, economist John Maynard Keynes made a strong pronouncement in his short but influential essay, The Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. He declared that with a hundred years time, so now, the standard work week would be only 15 hours, that we would have solved the economic problem by now. And what did he mean by this economic problem? What he meant was subsistence living, that prior to 1800, virtually this is somewhere, some people call this the hockey stick of human progress, 1800 and before, there was very little progress. Most people, 99% of people in the world everywhere, were living in some sort of subsistence living mentality and rea reality. But something about the 1800, and, and it's that hard number, it's nice, 1800. 1800, it's kind of easy to remember, is pegged to a break in subsistence living. And largely what Keynes, it, it's, a, it's a great essay, you should read it, it's four pages. And he writes it very um, colloquially. And he argues that since we've solved the economic problem, since more of us have leisure freedom to do what we choose, that we should all, he predicted, which we're going to talk a little bit more about predictions later on in the talk, 
that by now, all of us will, have a, will be preparing for a 15-hour work week. Are your professors preparing you for a 15-hour work week? <laughs> professors, do you have a 15-hour work week? 15-hour work day, maybe, but not work week. And so a lot of people mock Maynard, John Maynard Keynes because of that pronouncement. But the essay is provocative in whether he was wrong in that predictive element is one thing. The core of the essay isn't that little quote where that's drawn from. The idea is because of the progress we have made through technological advancement, directly related to technology and what we're able to produce, whether per hectare or per acre, getting more barley and grain and corn per acre, whatever that technological progress was, we do have more free time. Just how do we fill it now? How do we fill it? And it seems technology has solved that problem for us as well. Well, it's almost an indisputable fact that in 1800, the hockey stick of human progress has made the majority of the world better off economically. Phrases like the great enrichment or superabundance are often focused on in a way that subtly distorts a full picture of the situation. Especially given the different ways in which technology subtly changes other aspects of culture, not simply economics. In other words, as Neil Postman has aptly noted in his prescient 1992 book, Technopoly, technological change is neither additive nor subtractive. It's ecological. And what he means by ecological is in the same sense that the word is used by environmental scientists. One significant change generates total change. In other words, we are embodied in a physical world and our technologies are tools that change us. There's a common phrase, many of you have probably heard it, that we make our tools and in the end our tools make us. Simple example. Where's my phone, right? I'm scared. We always like, where's my phone? We leave the house. How many times do you touch your phone per day? When I, when, I, when I want to say, you know, we are embodied in a physical world. How many times do you think on it, shout it out. How many times do you think you touch your phone, statistically, on an average day? Tell me. 300. Who, who else? Okay, collectively, 300. Good, you all agree. So somebody read the article or heard me lecture before. It's 300. Right at 300 to 350 times per day, we touch our smart device. What other thing do you do 300 times per day? I would argue you probably can't list anything that's not biological. In other words, blink, breathe, those kinds of things. You don't do anything else 300 times a day, repetitively. What do you think that does to you? So sometimes we talk about moralizing, and some of you were at a Christian college, which is great. Um, I'm a Protestant believer. It's fun to be a part of an of a institute of higher ed that we can talk and entertain those ideas. But a lot of times we, we devolve into moralism. Don't look at things that are naughty on your phone. What about simply having a phone? It's changing your patterns, whether or not what you're, regardless of what you're doing with it, how you're using the tool, the tool in and of itself is changing you. That, in essence, is media ecology. We try to think about how do media and technologies and the language we use around them change us. Because there are always trade-offs, always opportunity costs, always downsides to any kind of technological progress. I'm fond of reminding people these two ideas. Number one is from Paul Virilio, an uh, Italian philosopher. When you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. When you invent the plane, you also invent the plane crash. When you invent electricity, you invent... 
electrocution. Every technology carries its own negativity, which is invented at the same time as the technological progress. So Paul Rilio isn't a Luddite. He's not anti-technology. What he's saying is any technology in and of itself is not wholly positive. There are always downsides to any technology. And if this was a 16-week class where I could uh, uh, engage that for, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we could have a lot of fun with thinking through what does it mean to have automobiles? What does it mean to have the interstate? What does it mean to have suburbs? What does it mean to have only 1.4% of America engaged in any kind of agrarian production? 1.4% of Americans provide food, not only for 335-ish million people in America, but we're a net exporter of much of our food. When you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. And then secondly, Amara's Law, Amara, A-M-A-R-A, -A. named for Roy Amara, a futurist who died several years ago. Very simple, very simple idea. We tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. And he played with that sentence his entire life. We tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect of long, uh, in the long run. Zoom. Wow. I mean, here, some of you are watching me. Hello on live stream. It's two different things going on here. I'm in the room. I can look in your eyes. I can see your body language. I can engage with you in a very physical, embodied presence. And while somebody on the other end can listen to me on the live stream, it's fundamentally different. And Zoom, during COVID, overtook our lives, right? We had to do it. It was a necessity. We, uh, we like frictionless, it's called frictionless interactions. And during COVID, we moved to Zoom. Many of us. Some of you might still be on that. But we realized in the short term, yay, this is great. In the long term, some of us are like, nah, not really. We got to do something different. And we're trying to evolve out of that four-year pattern. So what do I mean by technology? By technology, it's the systematic application of knowledge, methods, and tools to various practical tasks. By modern technology, what we mean is the directions that our devices and systems appear to be heading and what their continued growth might portend for us. I like that quote from Craig Gay in his book, Modern Technology in the Human Future. Pretty simple. But what does it encompass? How many of you play a musical instrument? Let me see your hands. All right. Technology. Somebody thought about that, invented it, the way it moves air, and the way you manipulate the machine itself. It's a, it's a technology. How many of you woke up this morning and click, flicked on the lights? The system of electricity that we take for granted. This last week, most of you, I know this is kind of base, but every morning, most of you probably hit the flush. Many people argue that the development and engagement with sewer systems, clean water and clean moving of affluent waste, is one of the chief technological advancements in first world countries. Last week, Sunday afternoon, I get home from church and I flip on the, the, the tap to, to wash some dishes. And I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan now. The town itself is about 300,000, but we have 1.3 million people in the statistical area. So it's a big area, second largest city in Michigan. And the, the tap spit at me. It was like, <laughs> and then just air. I was like, oh, that's weird. I went into the bathroom, tried that, went downstairs, tried that. All of it was the same. Texted my neighbor, hoping it wasn't, you know, the tree, maple tree in our front yard growing into our pipes. And they're like, yeah, we don't have water either. There was a water main break about a mile south of us. And it, they didn't catch it fast enough. And it ended up tripping five sensors 
every substation that cleaned water in the northeast side of Grand Rapids burned out instantly. 250,000 people were without water for four days. You would think the world was ending. It kind of was. My son and I, my son, a big strapping 17-year-old, I'm like, we got to go to the store right now. And we went to the store. There were 50 people in the water aisle. 50. Honest to God, I have pictures of it. Stacks of water in their carts. This was like an hour after we figured out we didn't have water. What's the prepper rule? You know, within 72, you know, if you watch enough science fiction, within 72 hours it all goes to Hades. If systems go down, some of you are shaking your head. I know what you watch. Um, if you lose your electricity, you lose your water, etc. how are we dependent on those technologies? Those are systems, technological systems that we don't realize every day. And on this spectrum of technology, we have techno-optimism and techno-pessimism. We like to talk about the poles, techno-optimism and techno-pessimism. Techno-optimism that technology can continually be improved and can improve the lives of people, making the world a better place. If you're a techno-optimist, you think technology has consistently improved our lives for the better and is likely to do so in the future. Techno-optimist. Techno-pessimist. A pessimist is likely to believe that modern technology has created as many problems for humanity as it solved. The pessimist believes that seeking more technology is likely to bring about new problems and unforeseen consequences and dangers. Given that the pessimist sees technology creating its own problems, the answer to human progress often lies in a reduction to technological prog uh, dependence rather than an expansion of it. Sometimes this is called the instrumentalist versus determinist view as well. And so how many of you, and again, it's a spectrum, even though the news articles usually focus on the polls, how many of you would generally say you're a techno-optimist? Technology is generally good, you love it, 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 it makes life better. Come on, raise your hand, this is, okay. Well, how, how many of you say generally on the spectrum you lean techno-pessimist? Okay, about the same number of hands, which were few, so how many of you, I guess you're following Aristotle, right? The golden mean. How many of you are right down the middle? Okay. Some of you, you got you to gotta stick with me here. Let that, ca let that caffeine hit. One thing I want to argue, though, and speaking of Aristotle and the golden mean, we want to be very careful when we're presenting these topics about moral panic. Many people are really good on both sides of this, of creating moral panic. Christians can do this just as easily as secular people. We freak out. And so without this framework, it's easy to fall into a moral panic because we saw Terminator 2 last night and it's inhabiting our dreams. Or Netflix, you know, Altered Carbon, which we'll get to in a second, right? Where specifically with transhumanism, how many of you saw the Netflix series Altered Carbon? Two, two seasons, right? You get a chip in the back of your head and you, your, your skins are different. You can hop in. One, one season was a black dude. The other season, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter what the configuration is as long as the chip, right? So is that where we're headed? Is that the moral, you know, do we want to have all this crit hype? If you were to follow this kind of reasoning about 15 years ago, do any of you remember, probably professors maybe, there was an N-word that dealt with technology, and it was a certain kind of technology that was talked about breathlessly like AI is now. It was a certain kind of technology. Anybody remember this? Well, Napster, okay, yeah, that's a very specific kind. You're right. And Metallica shut that one down, right? You know, no, no Napster for Metallica. Um, nanotechnology nanobots, nano this, nano that. If you study the history of technological innovation, there are always ebbs and flows with these ideas, and there's crita hype around it. A lot of hype that turns into literally nothing, or it's absorbed in a very specific kind of industry, medical and others, that they've absorbed a little bit of nanotech, and it's functioning, and it, but it did not save the world. Likewise, it didn't end it either. 
but nobody really talks about nanotechnology anymore within this, without uh, the, the, the panic around it that used to be engaged in the conversation. Consider just the recent quotes on the subject of AI. AI is probably the most important thing humanity has ever worked on. I think of it as something more profound than electricity or fire. Sundar Pichai, CEO of Alphabet, Google, at the World Economic Forum two year, three years ago. More in profound than electricity or fire. All these changes are going to happen in the next five years. And when I say that, I don't mean five years from now. I mean you're going to see changes next year, bigger ones the year after that. It's all going to change extremely fast. Ray Dalio, billionaire investor and founder of Bridgewater Associates, on a, in a CNBC uh, interview just this past September. He's investing billions of dollars in this technology right now. And then on the flip side, a lot of AI researchers and pundits imagine the world is already digital. And that simply introducing new AI systems will immediately trickle down to operational changes in the field, in the supply chain, on the factory floor, in the design of products. Nothing could be further from the truth. Almost all innovations in robotics and AI take far, far longer to be really widely deployed than people in the field and outside the field imagine some weird Luddite who hates technology, right? Rodney Brooks, former director of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. Arguably one of the leading institutions in the world studying AI and robotics. And so there, there, this is two examples, three examples of crit hype There's hype on both, is it are they not coming to fruition? How long have we heard about self-driving cars? How long have we heard about EVs? Now there's a certain uh, electro, electric vehicles. Some of you have driven a Tesla, right? They're fun, Rivian, whatever. Four percent of vehicles are EV in America. Four percent. And I think that actually that number actually includes hybrids. They're no way taking off at all. Will they come someday? Maybe. The hype, the news, the cycle, what we think about the world in reality, they're saying could be very different. Here we have the, uh, what some are arguing, the fourth, the, the engagement of a fourth industrial revolution. First industrial revolution, quick primer, um, used water and steam, right? primarily in one part of the world to primarily change what one commodity. The first industrial revolution at that 1800, that hockey stick of human progress, 1800, what changed, what specific thing, what commodity in the 1760s to early 1800s? That comes next, good, good guess. Textiles, clothing, cotton, textiles. Very localized, regionally, and to largely one or two commodities. Obviously, there was trickle-down effects once that got moving, but largely that's the first industrial revolution. Second, power to create mass production lines. And here's where we get railroads and the assembly line and um, Henry Ford and the whole nine yards, um, roughly the 1870s to World War II, or one, really. Thing, funny anecdote, Henry Ford in my neck of the woods, Detroit, Dearborn, Michigan, um, anybody, there, there's a great museum on the outskirts. It used to be his private home where he retired. And he, at the end of his life, Henry Ford began to rue, look it up, he began to rue his invention because of all the follow-on effects that came, which they weren't called this at the time, but suburbs, the ability for more people to get out and about. And, and he, he kind of retracted and became kind of this curmudgeonly old man. But boy, did he change the world. Now they're arguing we're in the, some are arguing we're in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution. 
The fourth industrial revolution is the fusion of technologies, blurring, here's, here's where it's most important. All of those industrial revolutions usually happened regionally, some expanded, and eventually trickled down. But they were certain regions, certain commodities. Well, here's what's so different about the fourth. The digital revolution is a fusion of technologies blurring the lines between physical, digital, and biologic spheres. There are three reasons why this transformation represents not merely a prolongation of the third industrial revolution, which was simply chips, but a fourth and distinct one. It's the velocity, the scope, and the system's impact of these changes. The spread of current breakthroughs has no historical precedent. When compared to previous industrial revolutions, the fourth is evolving, and here's where the tension comes in, at an exponential rather than linear pace. Moreover, it's disrupting every industry in every country. You see the distinction there? And every country, India, surpassed China this last year as the most high, uh, largest population in the world. And there, I mean, technology and advancements in India right now, off the charts, as well as China, but they're declining in population, so they have demography issues along with economic issues and political issues. So there's interesting political engagements, economic engagements. Um, some people call this the new globalization. Different lecture. But it's the breadth and depth of these of entire systems of production, management, and governance. Again, I, I want to shy away a little bit from totalitizing narratives. That's professor speak for one kind of thing that explains all things. There's only one or two that I, I find credible. But this one is shaping up to be dealt with in a totalitizing way. The fourth industrial revolution is impacting everything. So I needed to build a framework before we got to transhumanism because it's that progression, that progress, that has allowed us to get to the topic of transhumanism. How are we going out there? Are we good? All right, we're still moving here. So what do I mean by transhumanism? The term can be traced as far back as Dante's uh, Paradiso. at least a, a translation of it in the last 200 years. But today, post-World War II, what we're talking about is simply, and I'm quoting Megan O'Giblin here, a former Moody Bible Institute student who, um, before exvangelical was a thing, became an exvangelical and actually left the faith. She writes widely and deeply and very humanely about these topics. She's an interesting read. Recommend her. But to quote Megan O'Giblin, the belief, transhumanism is the belief that humans use technologies to extend life, perhaps indefinitely, and to further our evolution into another species, post-humanity. Or as some other writers call it, H+. Plus. Back when all the rage was adding a plus sign right to everything. Humanity plus. And I'll stop, just humor, just for a second. About 10 years ago, there's a university in Iowa called Drake University. How many of you have heard of Drake? They instituted a million, back when the plus was really uh, the buzz, you added plus to, to make everything better. They spent over a million dollars, this is totally for free, this has nothing to do with they spent a million dollars on a marketing and ad campaign, and it passed all tests, and they put it on t-shirts, come to Drake for a D-plus education. <laughs> Let that one sink in. Come to Drake for a D-plus education. There was something missing in that. So oh, again, totally for free. Scrub that from the, uh, from the live stream later. But the idea of H plus, a humanity plus, transhumanists are arguing that what we are is a specific phase of humanity, a certain phase of evolution. And we are becoming or have the potential to become more than what we are because of that progression from first, second, third, fourth industrial revolution. The technological progress in biology, 
in cryonics, in so many different forms, are giving us more thought to maybe this isn't science fiction. Maybe this isn't altered carbon, a matrix, whatever. Maybe we can do it. Um, but it's not new. The 16th century of Francis Bacon writing about this. You have Gian Battista Vico in the late 1700s arguing verum quia factum. The only things we can truly know are the things we make. People were flirting with this in the Enlightenment all over. Obviously, they didn't have science and chips and things to think about in the way, but philosophically, theologically, they're at play in the very issues. With one, one of your esteemed professors earlier, and he's like, yeah, I, I still talk about some of the core, the root issues, not some of the fun, sexier things like AI, and, but we talk about what does it mean to be conscious? What does it mean to have a body and a mind? Where are those thoughts? Are those thoughts mine? Etc. Those are coming back in vogue. Martin Heidegger, love him or hate him, hate reading him, but the question concerning technology, first post World War II, gift group of lectures in 1949, published in 1954 in German, 1977 in English. He argues about the question concerning technology. We only view nature technically modern man right now what you and i we see each other our stuff our body the the technological man the technological way of viewing the world has invaded even how we think about we're just raw material able to make it remake it in any way we can provocative essay that kind of kicked off some of the modern thought on technology martin heidegger but the real development um, you know, ha is happening post-World War II, popularized in an article by Julian, Sir Julian Huxley. Sir Julian Huxley came from a famous family and connections in England. Obviously, his famous brother as well was who? Aldous Huxley, 1984, Animal Farm. They're all thinking about these topics in different ways. Aldous Huxley was thinking about it politically. But imagine those Thanksgiving dinners. Never mind. That was a slow burn. Um, Julian Huxley, and again, this is widely found. It's six or seven pages. His title, I think the original title was New Wine in Old Wineskins, but it's now been relabeled. So if you look up Julian Huxley and Transhumanism, you'll pop right up, free PDF, read it. I'm going to quote the selected sections. This was in the words of Julian Huxley. In 1949, we have pretty well finished the geographical exploration of the earth, the scientific exploration of nature, both lifeless and living, to a point at which its main, outline, its main outlines have become clear. But the exploration of human nature, its possibilities, has scarcely begun. A vast new world of uncharted possibilities await its Columbus. We are already justified in the conviction that human life as we know it in history is a wretched makeshift rooted in ignorance and that it could be transcended by a state of existence based on the illumination of knowledge and comprehension, just as our modern control of physical nature based on science transcends the fumbling of our ancestors. And that we are rooted in super, that we're rooted in superstition and professional secrecy. The human species can, if it wishes, transcend itself in its entirety as humanity. We need a name for this new belief. Perhaps transhumanism will serve. Man remaining man, but transcending himself while realizing new possibilities of and for his human nature. The human species will be on the threshold of a new kind of existence, as different from ours as ours from Peking Man. Peking Man was a skeletal, well, skeletal remains found in China at the time that was dominating scientific structures. But I think it was 10,000 years old. 
who's like, as different as we are from Peking man, this transhumanism will make us different. It will at last be consciously fulfilling its real destiny. Currently, there are several main cheerleaders for transhumanism, and there are a lot that dabble, a lot that comes out in ethics. Ethics is where you see a lot of this. But metaphysics plays here, epistemology plays here, the theology of God, the theology proper plays here, Anthro- human anthropology plays, I mean, all of the things you're studying in some form or another, biology, some of you are Daisy's students, right, you're, you're understanding cellular, you're, how biology interacts, this covers all disciplines. This, you can engage all disciplines with this topic. But, uh, who kind of helped bring this to American four. He was Iranian-Belgian, but lived most of his life in America, named Feridun, excuse me, Feridun Estefandri. He lived from 1930 to 2000. He's most famous for his book in 1989, Are You a Transhuman? In fact, he went so far to deny his humanity, to deny which country he was from, to deny gender, like all that. He's like, you can't put me in a box. You think that's original to now? Not so much. He renamed himself FM2030. Legally. It's pulled over, shows his license, it's FM2030. And he did it because 2030, would, he would be 100 years old in 2030. He only to 2000, he died of cancer. But he wrote heavily, very heavily in the, in the uh, Hollywood scene, and and engaging this idea, um, and I'm going to come back to him in just a minute. Second one is Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil is currently alive, born in 1948, massive inventor, venture capitalist, and major AI uh, proponent. Um, His books, The Age of Intelligent Machines, put him on the map of this world, and then finally The Age of Spiritual Machines, a decade later. And he's the one that popularized the term the singularity. How many of you have heard about the singularity, where we will upload, kind of, the mat- kind of like it, the matrix, we'll be able to upload ourselves, or like altered carbon, into some sort of ethereal realm. Not the internet, but something similar. Ray Kurzweil. Most of you probably know his name because in your worship services, in your big Eva churches, somebody's playing a Kurzweil synthesizer. It's printed on the back. How many of you have seen that? So he, he's a musical genius. He invented this synth that nobody else could invent and then all kinds of dabbled in all kinds of other scientific inventions. Multi-centimillionaire dabbling in these topics. Both FM2030 and Ray Kurzweil, well, FM2030 is already vitrified, but Ray Kurzweil is also going to be interred or vitrified right down the road. How many of you in Scotts, know in Scottsdale, Arizona, one of the top world is about five miles away. FM 2030 is currently suspended there. Vitrified, it's flash frozen. And he's in a stainless steel canister about five miles away. That he vitrified we solve some of these technical issues. Israel has a policy that when he dies, his body will be interred there as well. Extension Foundation, the all Foundation, in your backyard. Major and engaging this topic is Nick Bostrom, born in 1973. Well, no, he's not a professor, adjunct now. Um, his book, Super Intelligence 2014, put him on the map and engaging this idea that humanity is instrumentalized. What he wants humanity to be instrumentalized towards a certain kind of unity or convergence. Arguably, these heretical beliefs started in the garden. Remind me, re- uh, remember with me Genesis 3, uh, 1 through 7. The serpent came to Eve, and remember the, she's like, what's the temptation? You will be like 
God. And if you start to dabble in the transhumanism conversation, most of it begins when we talk about a heresy, a way of thinking non-Orthodox beliefs about specifically Christianity. It has to do with this fundamental root of wanting to be like a god. Or, in some of their writings, God himself. I will be God. I will maintain my individuality. I will upload who I am. And then that will transcend into some sort of eschatological vision. Most of these writings, you'll notice, you'll recognize, this is where Megan O'Giblin is so good, even though she's not a Christian anymore, she says it's undeniably religious. She's coming back full circle to David Nye, arguing that technological progress is America's true civil religion. Megan O'Giblin is arguing, yes, all of this talk about transhumanism, the language, the eschatological ideas, the ideas of salvation, it's, it's all there in just a different technical form. And you can't talk at a Christian college without quoting C.S. Lewis, and I'll close with this. But in arguably one of my writings of his, it's really a trilogy of lectures called The Abolition of Man, three chapters in his third chapter, but he was writing the article, um, The Poison of Subjectivism, around the same time. Great little essay. As well as writing the last book of his space trilogy, That Hideous Strength. All three of these triangulate the same kind of idea. But in his book, The Abolition of Man, which again was a collection of lectures, he argues this. What we call man's power is in reality a power possessed by some men which they may or may not allow other men to profit by. From this point of view, what we call man's power over nature, techne, techne, turns out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. Man's conquest of nature, if the dreams of some scientific planners are realized, means the rule of a few hundred men over billions and billions of men. Are we to be like gods? Does transhumanism offer the ultimate techno-optimist dream? I think it does. But does it correspond to reality? Is that what consciousness is? How do we know it's true or not? How do we separate it from hype? If somebody offers you all the answers to those questions, they're trying to sell you something. These have been age-old conversations. Age-old, you're learning them in your philosophy classes. You're, you're the, the roots of these conversations in your biology classes, in your theology classes. Listen to your professors. Read deeply, well. And I want to encourage you and welcome you to the conversation about our new future. Thank you. the D plus education uh, advertised in some places. All right, so uh, we're gonna have an intermission in just a moment. Toward the back in both directions, there are tables with index cards. If you'd like to submit a question for discussion uh, during the panel uh, discussion that's going to follow, go ahead, write that down, drop it in the basket. Um, you'll notice uh, at about 10 a.m. we're gonna come back, so that gives us about seven minutes. So if you wanna step out or stand up, stretch a little bit, we'll reconvene in just a moment. Thanks a lot.
probably stay in the back just so I can get out if I need to help in the lobby. But if you're noticing something's wrong, you just come here and these are the volumes. Oh, okay. For so each you of just, the microphones? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So they should be each labeled okay. one, two, three, or four. Is that yours oh, or mine? I'm sorry. I think that's yours. Okay. It looks like mine. Okay, yeah, no, good. <laughs> so sorry. Am I going to wear this up there or are we going to use handouts? Okay. Yeah, fair enough. No, no, no. Well, I, don't want to talk. I mean, I, I want this to be a true panel. This will be fun. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll figure it out. Oh, thank you. Sure. Most everybody was uh, you know, like, tuning in. Like, it was good. A good eye contact. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. 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 I was looking around as well, trying to snap a few photos and interact with Taryn, but I think it's going pretty well. Good. I mean, anytime you have students quiet and focused, it's... Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. How do you define being God? That's an interesting one. Oh, yeah. It's a major positive of transhuman, it's a major negative. I think we I feel like you're, you're kind of touching on that. There's a variation of that in our other questions, too, so that, that'll be a good one. Yeah. Are there any other indicates other than cry freezing, cryo freezing, that could lead one to think that transhumanism could become reality? Yeah, reality, yeah. All right. I'll, you know what? I'll play with these a little bit okay. because we've got kind of the set list. This, Chip size is, that's a fun one on chip size, like uh, Jensen Huang and NVIDIA and others, you yeah. know, the way, the way computing is moving and okay. things, so that, okay. that actually is a fun one. Okay. I, I know like it was a little more framing, mm -hmm. and so maybe we can get more, if we want to get more technical, oh, but I, hope, I wanted to give, in this kind of setting, I, I try to give a, a lot of talk. Because they're not all philosophers, they're not all theologians, yeah. they're not all, you know, some of bio, some of, you know, and, and, and try to get them to perk up at certain areas yeah. so that then they'll run with it. But it you have so, to, your audience is very yeah, 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 so hopefully at universities like this, that, that would be. Effective. You've got faculty action kind of across the board, too. Good. Because they're interested in what you're talking Oh, there was some, too. yeah, yeah, it was good to see the, I assume you know, a lot of the older people were, yeah. were, were, were faculty. <laughs> but they, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but they were, uh, they, were perk, they, they were perked up, they were, yeah. were too good. I think you're right. I think framing it is probably the best way to do it. We can chase things down as far as we need to. Don't don't feel. I mean, do the politician thing. If there's a point you need to make and the question doesn't get you there, make your point. Well, Fair <laughs> enough. Happy. Fair enough.
I'm totally Dan. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that's <laughs> my high school, uh, yeah, different. My high school nickname was Winston because Churchwell, Churchill, you know. And, uh, but no, yeah, Dan is. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started again. That was very loud. Sorry about that. Uh, as you've noticed, a, a few people have stepped out. So if you'd like to come toward the front, you can. It's just a little thinner and a little more spread out. If you want to stay where you are, that's fine. But uh, this will be a little more of an engaging uh, conversation, questions for our speaker and a conversation among the panelists. So uh, we're going to get started. Um, I'm going I'm to uh, introduce, introduce some of the folks that are up here and let them maybe uh, uh, explore a little bit further uh, some of the things that were introduced by Dan in the first part of the discussion, and then we'll begin to work through some of the questions. Our ASA chapter here on campus has submitted a few questions in advance. Fantastic uh, chapter on campus connected to the College of uh, Natural Sciences. And so we've got a few student questions, but uh, to begin with, I'd like to introduce Dan Kemp. Uh, Dan Kemp, uh, instructor of philosophy and Christian worldview in the College of Theology. Dan, uh, you've heard the other Dan speak already. Uh, what would you like to explore a little further? Yeah, okay, so thanks, uh, thanks Dan, for the talk. Um, I guess I want to pick up where you left off at the end with the Lewis quote from The Evolution of Man, as you know, very formative um, essay. And as I understand the thesis of the last essay, The Evolution of Man, you might think of it this way. He doesn't put it in these terms, but, uh, but what he does say is, all of conquest of nature uh, 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 helps us approach nature's conquests of, of man, right? And you might think of it in terms of Lewis is trying to dispel this common idea that, that the increase of power over our environment through technology is like a hockey stick graph. Over time, um, we get more power, and the more power we get, the more power we are able to get. Um, Whereas Lewis is trying to say, that's not the right way to think of like the logic of technological development. What, the way we should think of it is more like a, a bell curve over time. Because eventually there's going to become a time where we gain so much ability to manipulate and control our environments that it extends to our ability to control other people. Uh, and so the, the, the generations that come later are actually weaker than the generations that came before. Now, uh, what I wonder is, what? What I'm curious to think, uh, probe your thoughts on is what shape, if, if, assuming that this prediction is right, what shape will that control take? Is it is it going to be? Do you think of it more of a, an Orwellian terms where we're we're like we're wanting to self-determine human nature into the future, and they're not going to have a choice about it, like what what it what it what it is that we want them to be, or maybe should we think of it in terms of like the Huxleyan temptations? as outlined in The Brave New World, where it's not going to be so much of like a receiving um, an inability to self-determine from the, from the transhumanist engineers, if you will, but rather an increased ability to determine my own, um, my own nature in maybe some sort of superficial way that, albeit, makes me kind of a part of the H-plus community. Yeah, the uh, if I were to do it all over again, I would go back to school for uh, to be intellectual history of the 20th century. I mean, it, the 20th century had to deal with so much fast. You know, I opened with a quote by John Maynard Keynes in 1930. He talks about human progress, but in that essay, he also talks about we will have this specifically if there aren't any big world wars. <laughs> and he wrote that in 1930. <laughs> And, um, you know, they're coming off the edge of, you know, he's writing right near the, the, the Great Depression, and he's like, if we can get through this depression, and there are no great other world wars, we'll have this utopia, you know. And, and Lewis is arguing in that essay, in that, that line of reasoning over a couple of years, 1942 through 1944, so pre-World War II concluding. And in that last part, he's talking about, like, conditioners, like men, you know, if, if uh, one of his examples is the idea of if one man carries me to walk, I better not say it's my power that I am walking. And that's my pair, that's my NIV version of what he's saying. But, but the idea there is the idea of what comes with power, what comes with advancement. Um, and when you talk about Huxley, uh, 
the, the dichotomy there, Animal Farm, um, 1984 versus Brave New World. Neil Postman has a beautiful engagement of that. And some people split it along the demarcations of the West versus the East, that particularly in America, we're more, we're choosing our own, right. choosing our own prison, um, to quote Creed. Um, none of you like Creed? My <laughs> own person? Okay, okay, genius, man, I'm dating myself. The office Re characters. Reunion tour. No, the band, man. Um, come on, come on. Um, I, I'm not fired. I think they're super cool, Dan. Yeah, 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 thanks, yeah. In the yeah in the, <laughs> they're coming back, reunion tour this summer. All right, no, um, you know, this idea of that we create our own prison, my own prison, you know, the, the joke with Scott Stapp, his song, but that um, in our own world, we choose what deadens us. We choose our soma. We choose our, our in the West. But in the East, it's more 1984, more dystopian. Um, Carl Strickmatter's book in tw uh, 2020, I think, we have been, har you have been harmonized about the Chinese social state, and it, it, it's a fascinating work, but he explores that more on the dystopian side of governmental top-down control rather than bottom-up individualizing, we choose our own mm -hmm. drug. So I, I, I think I like, I generally, I have some quibbles, but I, I generally fall, I, I think Postman was onto something with that demarcation. Okay, fantastic. I'd also like to introduce uh, Dr. Linnell Mason in the middle. Uh, Linnell, what would you like to, to explore a little bit further? Uh, yeah. Can you, the you may have the non-working. We have one we knew was going to be a... Hello? Okay. Um, so uh, my question is about the, developmental, uh, or the development of transhumanist technologies. Because um, usually, uh, you know, not, people who are advocates of developing these technologies aren't necessarily, let's say, going for the singularity, right? They're just saying these technologies can help uh, alleviate human suffering or there's an emphasis on efficiency in terms of production um, or even just like day-to-day -day life, we can be more efficient and spare some time. Um, so there, it seems at least um, generally speaking, these uh, technologies such as like, let's say um, AI, um, human uh, computer interfacing, um, life extension technologies, genetic engineering, um, seen as a good that we should pursue and develop. And I'm just wondering if we're thinking about human flourishing, it seems like our nature is limited because we're creatures and not the creator. And so because we have a limited nature and because our limitations seem to entail suffering, so if we're trying to develop technologies to alleviate suffering, there's a sense where we are, can apply these um, technologies in a way that actually doesn't um, eliminate, or eliminate suffering or maybe creates different kinds of suffering because we're not living according to our nature. For example, right, I'm thinking of, you know, by nature, human beings are social creatures. So um, that entails that if we're lonely, we suffer in response to that. So we might, let's say, create AI to alleviate human suffering by having AI socialize with human beings. Mm -hmm. And so we see that in uh, grief tech, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that seems to entail, right, the relief of some immediate suffering, but let's say create other kinds of suffering, perhaps that's not quite as noticeable, because I would think that people who are engaged in relationships with AI aren't flourishing as human beings. That seems to be intuitive, at least. Mm -hmm. So how do we, let's say, tackle the problem of suffering with technology without going so far as to create human misery, right? So doing this, um, alleviating suffering in accordance with human nature, right? Uh, acknowledging an immutable human nature, one that we don't create, obviously one that's been endowed to us by a creator. How do we uh, apply technology in a way that respects that? Yeah, I, and I, I go back to the quote. That's why the quote is so framing for me. Um, Paul Virilio's, when we invent the ship, we invent the shipwreck. And so that, that for, for me, in, in my thinking, I, I literally am haunted. I will go to my grave haunted by that quote. I, I literally, that's, you know, some of us all read certain things and there's certain pivot points in our education. Um, hopefully that continues the rest of our life, but that one is for me. And so when I read any art, the Krita hype, I'm, I am highly critical of any kind of marketing or branding. 
And you're totally right. Historically, if you look, many technologies are invented to alleviate certain kinds of suffering. So to allow technological advancement, I, um, I had emergency spine surgery in November. Came home from a trip in Houston, something clicked wrong in my back, and the next night my wife took me to the ER. And within an hour or so, I was in an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging machine. Any of you had those? Sounds like there's a machine gun going off right when you're in it for about a half hour, 40 minutes. Um, I'm a big dude, and they shove me in that thing, you know, and you're, you're just there. You're just locked out. But they got a brilliant image of a major bone spur impinging my lower spine, causing leg numbness, deadness, and tingling. I didn't have to go to a witch doctor. And so technology obviously alleviates issues. But it also causes issues along with it. Um, right now, just last week, a major Korean newspaper put out that the Korean and Japanese are leading the way in something called elder care or grief care for elders. And because of culturally who they are, but their demography issues, they haven't had children to take care of the elderly, which was traditionally in their history. And so what have they really done well, both the Koreans and the Japanese? Invented robotics, robot-like beings, to help take care of the infirm and largely elderly. And in um, this is Sherry Turkle's work alone together. She did her work in, in Japan uh, 15 years ago now. And they were leading now, now South Korea is is leapfrogging the Japanese on this. And what you have, we, there's a utopianism around alleviating suffering. There's nothing wrong with alleviating certain kinds of suffering. It's good. But again, back to my lecture, largely it's, I think it's rooted in the idea of a utopianism. You're great to call out, I think theologically, if some of you are studying theology, that idea of the creator creature distinction plays really heavily in the underlying theology and philosophy of this conversation. Who we are as created beings. Because if you believe that, if then, that should lead you to think about your humanity, my hum humanity, my em embodiedness, a certain kind of way that would honestly put certain philosophical and lim limits on what we think technology can and should do for us. So that's where the tension, I think, in that, yes, um, we want to alleviate harm. But at what cost? And when you listen and read and think about the people who are capital T transhumanists, what they're trying to get at is, is more of a utopian godlike stance than merely alleviating issues um, of general suffering. Excellent. Uh, one more introduction to round out our panel, Dr. Joe Miller, also College of Theology. Joe, what would you like to explore a little further with Dan? Yeah, Dan, that's great. And, and actually where you closed off on that in the theological side is kind of where my question uh, comes in at. So you mentioned uh, the one gal in your talk who had sort of deconstructed mm -hmm. and moved on from her faith, but there are a large segment of uh, transhumanist Christians that self-label as Christians and they, they, buy, they accept this idea of somehow we're going to uh, merge into the singularity and they then go and they work through their biblical theology yep. and then try to take certain words like salvation and say, well, how do we re-understand, re, re if that's, I'm, I can make it up, I have a PhD. Uh, we can, we can sort of recreate these definitions with these modern technological understandings. So if, if anybody's interested, folks like uh, Arthur Peacock, Philip uh, Clayton, Nancy Murphy, they all sort of define this singularity uh, uh, specifically in what they call the God self. So God, nature exists inside of God. And this God self is what will merge, will become one with this God self when we transcend what it means to be human. So we'll cease to be human. We sort of merge with the reality of God himself. So given that sort of framework uh, of how theology 
tends to be reinterpreted amongst those who are saying, okay, we can just rethink of our Christian definitions. Do you see any pathway where this transhumanist vision of uh, salvation redefined as singularity, does that match with any kind of biblical, historic Christian theology uh, or, or this idea of what the Bible would tell us is the nature of God, the nature of humans, and, and our, our eternal destiny? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would just quibble with one word. You know, words mean things, but it, you said there is a majority, and it, it's actually not. There's a, it's a very small subset. There's a minority of Christian, um, and, but it, they're influential, though. You know, so that they, have, they have a lot of influence, but there's not a lot of them. Um, but you can go find a, a Christian transhumanist association. Um, the, there's a Mormon transhumanist association that dabbles in some other interesting things about their theology that why they think it's important. Um, but yeah, the Christian transhumanism movement uh, largely breeds out of an eschatological vision of what, what is the end. What are the end times? What are certain verses in the New Testament pointing at where we will be like Him? And the, this idea, and, and they they map on in in my. Um, opinion and reading and thinking through some of this, I think there's a little bit of hermeneutical gy gymnastics um, that, that, they're that they're they are techno, they're honest, they're techno optimists at its core, and so they think that that they're trying to merge the theological frame with the techno utopianism, and they're honest about most of them, you know, and I really appreciate that um, in the honesty in a way that's orthodox. So it's hard to have a strong conversation with them um, because there are so many underpinnings that you have to define and redefine to get to the place where they're trying to engage transhumanism from an orthodox Christian perspective. Um, but it, it definitely, they're, they're a vocal minority, for sure. Yeah, so I'm just wondering how you think about the argument then that I, I, I've heard this recently. Um, about that, like when it comes to applying these kind of um, technologies to, let's say, body modification, what we're doing is we're entering into God's creative work mm -hmm. and able to create our own natures, right? So it's, it, I'm not going against anything, theologically speaking. I'm entering into that creative work yeah. that was started in the garden. Yep, that's that fourth uh, industrial revolution. Because we're able to now in the last few decades um, even the last few years, even more so, engage in the biologic sphere, the, the ethical questions and metaphysical questions of who we are, what, what does it mean to be me, ontological, what's the nature of the self, what's the nature of my consciousness. Those are huge recurring questions, I mean, throughout the Enlightenment, but even emerging more now. And so I think, I've heard it put this way, artificial intelligence could be collecting social security now. In other words, the artificial conversation, artificial intelligence was named at the Dartmouth Summer Institute in 1956. And so uh, AI has been around a long time and the promises and perils that have come from the conversation um, are interesting. And the artificial intelligence question that comes with this idea of uploading ourselves or becoming, um, in it, figuring out ways of enhancing versus transforming there are ways of genetic coding using CRISPR. How many of you have heard of CRISPR? If you're bio people, you know, you should be learning and thinking about this. But is there a way of using CRISPR to heal a disease in my specific body? Or is there a way of healing a genetic abnormality that transforms itself through sex in the genetic continuation of the species? There's a distinction there that I think we need to dabble in. Because if you can change something, now, this is getting back to Lewis's idea of the abolition of man. If you change something and you're riding on the shoulders, if you will, of past generations, are you becoming stronger or weaker? And Lewis argues we're actually becoming weaker the more technologically dependent we become. And I lean that way in thinking through when, when we're talking about ways of helping our physical nature uh, I was interviewing, uh, we have a podcast at Acton, and several, th three weeks ago now, I was interviewing one of the top software developers in all of Michigan. Um, he works with Fortune 100 companies. He's, I mean, just really a fascinating gentleman. And he, he proves or shows that much of technological innovation, especially in the med side, starts with this idea of wanting to help people. I mean, med tech, if you're wearables, 
If you want to invest in anything, you know, I, I got the Garmin Phoenix right now. Some of you are probably having wearables. You got the, I, um, the iPhone, you know, all attached to all your, I mean, wearables right now is the new trend. If you want to invest and make some money over the next five to eight years, invest in three or four companies in what's called med wearables. And there's now pills you can take that have nano particles in them and they can test all kinds of internal work. I mean, it's fascinating. So that what, what I think is most interesting for those who are students still here or teachers is to start to think about how do we integrate some of these conversations. Every single one of your disciplines is affected by these conversations, every single one of them, from theology to language to English to biology to engineering to business. In, I can't make this stuff up, in, in, in the Atlanta airport yesterday, hour-long layover, two business guys sitting next to me, one really young, like a young student, like just his first sales job, and he was taken on the road by this old, you know, you could just tell it was like a mentoring relationship, and I'm jamming my protein shake, you know, just getting jittery, realizing it's going to be a four-hour, you know, I just had surgery, and I got to sit for four hours in the aluminum tube, wasn't looking forward to that, and so I'm ready to get on, but all they're talking about is how AI is changing the way they do sales. That's all they did for an hour. I listened to, and just listen, didn't engage. It's everywhere. And so I would argue that we have to start thinking about, yeah, on the front edge, can technology alleviate, alleviate certain things? Absolutely. But philosophically or onto, where do I take that? Do I take that then I can cure sin? The fallenness of the world? You know, and, and the, the extension or the jumps um, that the, the transhumanists or people, in, in well-meaning, many of them are well-meaning. I don't, some of them are, are evil. There's a subset of them that truly, they, they, they want to do certain kind of modifications and they're wild to read. Absolutely wild and evil. The vast majority are not that. They're dabbling in ways and trying to make humanity generally better. But um, I, I think that the extensions that they try to jump into quickly lead to logical conclusion being, I will be like God. Okay, we've had some uh, fantastic questions submitted. You're actually covering some of them as you're talking, so I'll pass over the need for additional examples beyond cryogenics. I think we just heard several of those. I'm gonna take a couple steps toward uh, some ethical discussion, kind of open this up to the panel. First question kind of in, in that uh, vein is how can we ensure that access to transhumanist technologies is equitable and does not exacerbate existing social inequalities? I've talked a lot. So. I, don't, I don't mind. Uh, and then you guys can think about it. So uh, it, actually that question makes me think about the question you asked earlier. Uh, you know, are you, uh, what was the, what are your phrasing? Uh, are you an, a techno-optimist or techno-pessimist? Mm -hmm. Uh, I was telling you now, I say, I'm a techno-optimist, I'm a human pessimist. Uh, there's nothing good humans can't seem to mess up and use for harm. And so I, I think in answer to that question, I'm, I'm, I don't know there is any way to safeguard uh, those uh, human, different groups of people from those sort of inequities because we see that uh, the, the programming, we say, okay, AI is going to help us decide who gets grain here, who gets this food there, how is it going to be distributed, how are these technologies, if they're implants into our mind, who's going to get them, does everybody get them, uh, does some group have greater value to society itself, or do we base it off of what factor, that's the question that matters, and so because we can't agree on what factors into those decision-making processes, some group has to be set aside as, okay, well, that group doesn't get this technology, this group does. And so, you know, it depends on who's in control. What's their worldview? What's their philosophical, ethical framework for offering those technological advances uh, into the human and introducing them into certain human groups? And so I'm not optimistic that the, those questions can be answered in a positive way. I don't think there are any real safeguards uh, unless, of course, you know, we put God at the center of that and God's holiness at the center of that. But given the, the nature of the world that they're not interested in putting the holiness of God as the center of moral decision making, uh, barring that, I don't see much hope of uh, preventing more harm than good. 
Yeah, I'll kind of piggyback off of that. I, I kind of see, um, and this relates to the question that I asked and some things that you've already said, like that idea that these technologies are going to be applied where people view that suffering exists. And I kind of question our ability to really pinpoint um, the suffering that we need to apply technology to or the suffering that just results as a consequence of sin. Um, like like the, the example I gave of the, um, the idea that we want to socialize. And it seems like that need to socialize causes us suffering in some regard. Um, and that God has kind of used that suffering to then pursue relationships and healthy relationships that'll be emotionally satisfying and whatnot. But, but us being like, let's say selfish and wanting to be independent or in control of our relationships might then use the technology to facilitate our own autonomous control of certain relationships. And I, th I think we can expand this kind of outward where then we see needs to alleviate suffering in ways that are not necessarily good for human flourishing. And so, you know, and, and considering too that the people who are, who are gonna be making these decisions, perhaps it's AI, but ultimately if it's AI, it's whoever programmed the AI, right? And so it's people who don't necessarily have the Christian worldview that views suffering or the Imago Dei as Christians view that, the image of God and human nature and how human beings flourish. So all of those are probably not be taken in consideration. Maybe that's my pessimistic view and I take the more pessimistic lens on it, all of this anyways. Um, and so in a sense that at least for us as Christians who are, are you know, in perhaps whatever you're doing as a student, maybe you are in, uh, into these technologies in the sense that you'll be working in these technological fields or you're developing these technologies, you can have that mindset. Like I want to apply these technologies to alleviate human suffering that promotes human flourishing as opposed to hinders human flourishing. I don't have much to add to this, but just briefly, it sounds like from, from the talk we just heard, we maybe should get away from thinking of the technologies that transhumanism will be manifested in as primarily in terms of a product or a procedure. I mean, a, perhaps will manifest in such ways, but also maybe in ways in the, the entire kind of ecology of our technology is transformed uh, at all, that in such that it's, if everybody enters into the market mm -hmm. differently now. To go back to your automobile example, um, like the, 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 the inventions of roads led to the need for, uh, sorry, of automobiles led to the need for roads, everybody has access to the roads. Um, it's not like a, uh, it, most of the time, roads are not like something you, you know, pay to drive on. Um, uh, and so you, you could, you, and, and so maybe, maybe thinking about um, uh, trying to read the tea leaves of how the technology will advance and influence um, access to it. Uh, but thinking of it in terms of a, a change in, the, in ecology rather than like I'm going to have this new gadget. I'm going to have like. Uh, uh, um, Marnie McFly's, you know, floating skateboard that, that allows me to go and do cool things. Rather than having like the new gadget, it's it's going to change the way that we uh, that we interact with each other in the market in the first place. Yeah, the the, the mark of a well-trained mind is the ability to make distinctions. And Marvin Minsky famously said that AI is a suitcase word. Marvin Minsky is one of the thinker in, in this vein. Uh, Marvin Minsky was, help, was at the Dartmouth seminars and he argued it's a suitcase word because it needs to be unpacked. So when you hear somebody talking about AI, what is the next question that you should ask? What do you mean by that? Because there's 12 to 15 subsets of what we mean by AI. Are we talking about large language models? Are we talking about neural networks? Are we, what are we talking about? Because AI is like talking about God. Well, what do you mean? You know, we gotta ask a lot more formative questions. And um, so, so this concept, we have to really interrogate to have substantive conversation. It's fun to read the headlines. Um, yeah, one, one thing that you, your question made me think of, this idea, this last winter, a paper was released and it, talking about chat GPT, that's the rage, right? But that's a large language model and, and 
and largely it depends on the prompts you give it. We, we shouldn't give too much hype to it because it's all about the, what we should be studying is how we prompt it, not necessarily the outputs. Um, but the, an article came out by esteemed researchers in this field and they, they're arguing that the longer, <laughs> even though it's only in, in the current manifestation how we think about it, has only been around three, you know, about three years. It's largely the more we use it, the more we trust it, so the more it goes in the background and nobody, everybody's talking about fact checking, right? Let's fact check the AI. Is the AI giving us good responses? Well, the more we use it, the more trusting we become, the less the fact checkers, the less we fact check what's being put out, and the more it becomes somewhat true. There's problems with that. Obviously, you should see that on its face, no matter if you're secular, no matter, I mean, the, the, the information getting spit back out, um, we trust it more and more the more we use it. That's ecological. Uh, one last thing I'll quit and we'll get to another question, but the idea is um, Neil Postman argued that in the 14th century, you didn't have the printing press plus Europe. You had a whole new Europe. In other words, the idea that the printing press revolutionized religion, politics. I mean, you can go down the line and study that moment. It was an ecological change to have the printing press unveiled at scale on the world. And this is where I love, you know, uh, literature, media, and the arts. This is where writing, this is where movies, this is, if you want to explore, if you haven't seen the movie Gattaca, you've got to watch Gattaca, because that explores this very specific topic, the have, have nots. It's a brilliant dystopian movie, Gattaca. Or on a more pop culture one, Elysium, with, um, who's a, uh, uh, Martin, Matt Damon, I was, yeah. Matt Damon in Elysium, and uh, I mean, they're, they're always exploring. It seems that many people intuitively know, if you have followed C.S. Lewis's quote, billions and billions of people will be controlled by hundreds and hundreds of men. And obviously, I don't think we want that. Maybe we do. I was, can I add something? Yeah, I was just thinking about, like, you had mentioned specifically a transhumanist. Um, who, who had said that, you know, we're all instrumental in terms mm -hmm. of reaching the Nick singular. Yeah. yeah, and so that, that idea of just making us either um, conducive or um, roadblocks to the utopia seems to be, like, you know, one of the problems. Like, if we are looking at humans as either being inherently valuable or instrumental, yes. Can, can I piggyback that real quick? So the, the question of roadblock, how many of you have heard the term Luddites? How many of you are Luddites? Okay, <laughs> usually in the phrase Luddite means what? what, what if you, in colloquialism, what, what does it mean? Anti An, you're anti-tech, right? You're a roadblock. And if you, there's a brilliant book, The Blood and the Machine, and others that have studied the Luddites. Um, uh, if, you're, if you like this, and you, the, the, there's an economic historian at Oxford named Carl Benedict Frey, and he wrote the book called The Technology Trap. Highly recommend it ultimately readable. It's a decent sized book, but he's a good writer. Not all economic historians are good writers. He is a, actually a really great writer. 2019, University of Princeton Press, The Technology Trap. Um, but he, he first cues into this idea. The Luddites weren't angry simply in that first industrial revolution, right? That's what it was about. The first industrial revolution, textiles, usually it, your business, your village, your home life, was all around the hearth, the loom, and your agrarian, and that, that, was a, that was your core, that was your culture, that was your cultus. They weren't merely angry at the machinery coming in, they were angry because, and frustrated because the whole way of life they knew was going away. It was a cultural change, they weren't angry at machines per se. It was because what it did to their culture of family, village, hearth, worth. And Carl Benedict Frey, in his book, points out, sometimes we just talk about Luddites, it was a rebellion, they got mad and they broke some stuff. That's kind of the narrative. It took more troops than it took to, uh, to defeat Napoleon 
to t- put down the rebellions of 1809 to 1814, the Luddite rebellions. And so the Napoleonic Wars, there were more troops invested in putting that. So it was a huge widespread rebellion. And Frey, who is generally a techno-optimist, what I gained and, and really appreciated about his book, he says, look, techno, techno-progress is a good thing, but it generally takes, from a historical perspective, two to three generations to manifest itself in the fully positive. So what's the second word of industrial revolution? As an economic historian, he goes through and points out the revolutions that have happened. And if we're in the fourth industrial revolution, what are the pieces of the revolution right now that are the underpinnings? Is it our political system? Is it the incivility? Is it the worldwide knowledge? I mean, within a moment of the latest massacre in Russia over the weekend, we had video of ISIS members, purportedly, I mean, we honestly don't know, seems to be ISIS has taken credit for killing 130 people with AK-47s in a major theater in Moscow. And we had it almost live. And so the technological way in which we approach the world, and now I'm on a plane, you know, thinking about, I, I, I have instant access to all good and bad around the world. And that is ecologically different for us. It changes us. It's, it, it changes us. Okay, I'm going to ask the next sort of question in two ways based on a couple questions that, that have come in. One is more principled, uh, which is where do we draw the ethical line in transhumanism from a Christian perspective? So sort of pushing toward where do we actually start to create boundaries or establish some sort of uh, boundary on this? What is helpful? What is becoming dangerous? Um, I'm going to add another question to sort of take it in a specific direction, maybe playing off of some of what we've already heard, which is we may be uh, crossing boundaries already. If we already depend so heavily on so many different technologies, how is transhumanism any different? For example, uh, for instance, it could be argued that databases are already an extension of our intelligence and knowledge. All right, I'll go first again. Yeah. I don't mind. Uh, I give you all time to think and be sound smarter than me. Uh, so I, I, there's a couple ways I could approach this. I'll just give you one thought as we come up, especially when the idea of you know how you know wh- where do we draw this line? Where do we draw this distinction? So I'll kind of answer this sort of in a theological sense. Uh, I, I remember you know back when I was a youth pastor many many uh, decades ago, and you know when it came to dating. Students were always like, well, how far is too far? You know, holding hands or kissing, you know, oh, what's the, what's the line Christians should draw this point of how far is too far? And I always thought, I was like, look, if you're asking, you know, how close you can get to the line of sin before you've crossed over, you're asking the wrong Christian worldview type question. The question is not how close can I get before I sin. The question is how close to God can I get that I'm not even worried about the line. Right? Because I, I, I'm not even worried about how close I am to this sin because I'm pers- in pursuit of God. And so I, I think in, in a Christian worldview, that perspective about this question, it's not how much technology can I incorporate into my existence before I cross the line, become transhuman versus human. The question is how much can I embrace the theology of humanity, the theology of God, and if I'm pursuing that, I won't even get close to worrying about that line. The big concern here is that when we, if we take that, begin with the assumption that what it means to be human is defined by us, the I think therefore I am, that I create my own reality, or we think therefore we are, society determines who I am, as opposed to God spoke therefore I am, right? God said you are this, therefore we are. And so when we stabilize the definition of who we are in the declaration of God himself, then we can allow for you know, modifications of like you know, bionic legs or whatever those might be because it doesn't change the essence of who we are. And if we can't change the essence of who we are, we can't have a, a foundation for dehumanizing someone else as other, whether they have some brain power that's enhanced or a physical strength that's enhanced, they're still the same human with the same fundamental image of God, that Betzalem Elohim that gives them that sacred worth and value. And so if we pursue that, 
the sacredness in each other as opposed to how far can I get, then I don't think we're going to have to worry as much about those boundary questions. I think one distinction that's really helpful here that's been made by some Christian ethicists, uh, what comes to mind is Gilbert Mylander and some of his work, is the distinction between therapy, um, which is not necessarily exclusive to like, I suppose, uh, seeing a therapist, but ther like, you know, fixing a knee or something like that, and enhancement. Therapy versus enhancement. So therapeutic technologies try, they, therapeutic technologies succeed depending on how well that they uh, enable the, the, the patient to conform to some sort of antecedent standard um, of human nature. They're, they're able to live the, the, the human way of life. Um, enhancement doesn't have that standard. It's not like that sort of, I suppose, backward looking standard. It's trying to accomplish something new, uh, perhaps open ended or some, some sort of envisioned, uh, untried uh, future. But it, it's not looking to um, the anteceding uh, human nature as a standard by which it, that, that is trying to bring about. It's trying to bring about some sort of new envisioned um, product. And um, I think that you, know, you may not agree with the distinction or, or think it's helpful, but I, it, I do think it's helpful for um, uh, getting a start to answering these questions. There are issues with it, however, which is one is you got to have a idea of what human nature is. <laughs> For, for the distinction to be useful. You gotta know what it means to be human. Um, and uh, you gotta know what it means to live a human form of life. What is it, what it, it, is it to be human, just to have you know, the appendages I do, and um, you know, to, to have the sort of genetic sequence I do, or is it to be inherently social kind of creature? In what ways is it to be social? Is it certain kinds of relationships I'm meant for, I'm meant for and perhaps uh, other kinds of relationships I'm not meant for? and so on. You have to answer those questions um, in order to be able to draw this line. And then the second issue, which I kind of want to turn into maybe some, a question to explore, I don't want to hijack the panel, but something to think about, is it is just an intellectual distinction <laughs> um, based in reality, but it's, it's an intellectual one. And it, you know, merely rational realizations haven't always been the best at keeping people from using technologies in ways that uh, maybe on an individual level don't lead to negative outcomes, but when everybody acts in, in, in those ways, it could lead to, to negative outcomes. So um, I'm interested, and I have no solutions here, but I'm interested in how do we set up those guardrails in a way that um, incentivize people to use forthcoming technologies in a way that promotes human flourishing. Yeah, and to kind of piggyback on it, you had like the very important, the very important task, I think, as Christians to actually understand what the image of God is, to understand what human nature is, right? The idea of that, actually, I need to do metaphysics, I need to do theology, I need to understand these things at a deeper level. And also to be able to understand that the broader culture has a different view of metaphysics and theology that then hum uh, sorry Christians do, and then on in top of that to understand that the way that these technolo technologies are being developed is with the presumption of a um, ba it's based on a presumption of what a human being is. So within the technology itself is already a presumption about what a human being is, right? I think specifically about. Um, the um, development of AI technology um, has a presumption about what human consciousness is, right? Well, they're trying to mimic human consciousness and they're trying to, um, let's say, uh, build something that is indistinguishable both ontologically and just in practicality from a human being. Um, we also think about, um, you know, transhumanism has a view of the human being as a material malleable thing and that, you know, is a, a lead modern uh, development of uh, the human being being as something as uh, malleable uh, and we are um, are able to let's say create and recreate that as we see fit right there is no let's say deeper soul that is immutable that determines what we are and what will flourish us um, so I think if we have that context even if we don't say have fully fleshed out view of what the human nature is we have an idea that um, you know 
theologically speaking, were different um, in reality than, let's say, what these technologies imply. And I think we can at least approach the problem with that, where the implication is that um, I'm something different than this technology assumes that I am. And then we can kind of move forward um, thinking about how to apply those technologies with that in mind and perhaps you know, just studying theology, right, will get us some truths. Um, obviously, we have a lot of biblical truths, um, especially in terms of our relationship with God, and that, as Joe was saying, that is primary, that we need to get that right before we can move forward in any, say, like applying technology to alleviate human suffering, um, and so that we can kind of move forward, I guess, on that foot. Very brief comment. Um whoever wrote that, if you're, if you're still in the room and wrote that, the, the key word there is extension. And the most provocative thinker on this topic about technology as extensions of man is Marshall McLuhan. And Marshall McLuhan talks about all the time, and he, he helped popularize this idea that technology are merely extensions. The bicycle is the extension of the foot, etc. And so if you want to read the laws of media, and I mean understanding media and Marshall McLuhan from the 60s, he was arguably one of the famous, most famous technological thinkers in the 70s. He was in a, um, he was in movies, he got hired, I mean he was a, a Canadian philosopher and, and la a studier of language at University of Toronto, but Marshall McLuhan is very keen, yes, the computer is an extension of our brain, but it is not our brain. That's why the mark of a well-trained mind is the ability to make distinctions. Yes, it does house information, but how do we distinguish that from an epistemological term? Knowledge is that wisdom, is that ver just because it has, um, right now in business, predictive analytics is huge. And you have volumes and volumes and reams and chips. You have Jensen Huang, who is the CEO of NVIDIA, three weeks ago, sitting on the stage in the largest Saudi Arabian, in, in the Middle Eastern kind of version of CES, the, the largest techno uh, conference, and, and he's saying, look at this chip. This chip, it took us $10 billion to develop, and it's going to push us into the next phase of artificial intelligence. And you have these extensions. You have unprecedented access to information, but that doesn't mean we understand how to interpret it or know it. And so this idea of, whoever wrote that is really onto something, this idea of extensions of shouldn't be confused with the thing, quoth, the thing as a thing. It's not your brain, but it's like a brain. And why do those distinctions matter? That's where you should, you should play. Okay, fantastic. We've got about two, three minutes left. I'm gonna ask a type of question. You'll have to respond short form. Dan, I'll let you start. If we run out of time, we'll just, we'll just call it a day. But um, a number of questions are kind of in the vicinity of should we, be, should we do biohacking? Should we do some of the things we could do? What about those with disabilities, things that might be good? Uh, what about some of those things that were actually exacerbating? Some mental health issues are actually exacerbated by the, uh, the development of antidepressants and so forth. So maybe let's focus on this question, really simple. How do you define being God? So my question is sort of, what are the prerogatives? Like, like what sorts of things should we leave to God in light of the conversation? Short form, if you can. This is like a political debate where they solve the Middle East, con, you know, solve the Middle East issues, you have 30 seconds. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> how, where do I go? Uh, <laughs> this is wild. Um, so, so what's the crux of the question? What, what are the line? What, what are the what are the things we want to think of as belonging to God in light of what we've just said, as opposed to hey, we we know what's best. I don't want to do a cop out, but the idea of the creator creature distinction: Are we creatures? Why is the idea of creatureliness so embedded in Orthodox Christian theology? What does creature? What does it mean for me to be a creature? And what does what subsumes? Is there a creator? And what does that mean? That I mean, theological and ph obviously philosophy dabbles in that as well. So. The creator-creature distinction is highly influential in this conversation. Just really quick, off the top of my head, I not it's not an answer to the question, but it's more of a method uh, that needs to be a part of the conversation. Is I do think that there's um there's a lot of guidance in God's word here uh, to think about. Um, it, it's not going to answer every single applica applied question, 
but uh, lots of stuff in the New Testament and the epistles about what, what kinds of things should we care about and what kinds of things should we think of as like, you know, twaddle that's going, that's not really important. Um, uh, and uh, I would just encourage Christians to, to start there. Um, I would say approaching this, these issues of applying technology with intellectual humility. Mm. We are not God, we do not possess his knowledge. We don't know what a human being is. Um, and I think um, people tend to apply these as if they're 100% certain about what a human being is. Um, but if we know anything about uh, history of science and inductive reasoning, then we know that everything we think we know about science right now will be overturned in the future with some better um, theory to account for these things. So I think that we should approach any kind of question about how we apply uh, these technologies with intellectual humanity, um, humility. So I, I'd give three guardrails for this. Uh, th one, the theological, moral, and then practical. Theologically, uh, there is no distinction because everything belongs to God. So there isn't what belongs to us versus what belongs to, to, uh, to God. It all uh, belongs to him. So that's the first theological. On the moral side, uh, you know, the, the old, the old uh, medical axiom, do no harm. In the 1970s, the Supreme Court, uh, when it was doing Roe v. Wade, basically you said that's, a, that's a sort of an antiquated uh, idea that was predicated on a Christian worldview and so we don't want to have uh, Christian thinking enshrined into our law so this whole idea of do no harm has been subverted in the medical industry uh, so sometimes we pursue technology just because we can without thinking about the moral implications of what actually harm are we creating that we don't even intend as Dan brought out in his talk and then the third guardrail, just the sort of practical speaking side of it, we talk about CRISPR or biohacking. The problem with all of that is that we don't have the humility that was being discussed uh, by Linnell, you know, is uh, we assume that the genetic code can, if we can tweak this part or this part, that somehow that's going to produce this result. But, I mean, we used to think that uh, the majority of the genetic code was junk DNA. But we realize now that a lot of it's functional, special in fetal development and other processes that we haven't even begun to wrap our minds around. So we have no idea what the consequences are uh, when we tweak some sort of little tiny part. We think it's going to have no impact anywhere else. Uh, and basically it's human experimentation without knowing the results. And if we value the sacredness of every human made in the image of God, then we don't have the authority to experiment on little babies. That, well, you know, we'll see. We'll figure out if this works or not. Uh, we don't want to be the vic you know, make victims out of our good intentions. Okay, fantastic. Thanks to all of you. Uh, can we show gratitude to the panel? <laughs> uh, so, uh, Dr. Wood is going to come forward here. Uh, just before I hand the microphone off to uh, Dr. Wooden, uh, I do want to make sure everybody has to hear this question because it's going to be on my mind every time I'm in the vicinity of Scottsdale. What are your thoughts on cryogenics? Do you think they have thoughts? <laughs> All right, with that. With that. <laughs> you know, they, they said, Mark, why don't you go ahead and close this thing down? And I thought, this is like AI, man. I'm excited. I'm ex I didn't think about the consequences. I have to end their conversation by closing this down, right? And I've really appreciated the conversation you guys have had. Uh, it's been a great topic. I want to give thanks to Dan. Uh, I think you've given us a lot of relevant and thought-provoking questions to think about. The panel, you did a great job of engaging with the, the, the conversation. Uh, I'd really like to give a shout out to the attendees, all of you guys that are here, especially the students that stayed for the second part. Um, I think this is really, really important conversation, important things to hear. Um, I never think about it deeply until we get in a conversation like that. Um, so I'm glad we're doing this. Um, I think it's great for the university. I think it's great for you. Um, and I guess I'll close it off by saying I pray that we all walk away with greater insight and awareness, that we all take time to reflect on what we hear here today, and that we all turn our hearts back to God as we start to individually decide how to integrate this experience into our own lives going forward. And with that, we'll close this down, and thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Wooden. You're dismissed. Thank you for attending.